If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pause the video first and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. Our first step to solve the question is to draw a free body diagram that shows the forces acting on one of the two conducting balls. We will choose the ball on the left side of the figure. So let's go ahead and draw the forces acting on that ball. We have the downward gravitational force marked by mg, and we have also the tension in the rope that's pulling up on the ball and preventing it from falling downward. And then we have the electrostatic force that's pointing to the left. Notice that it is pointing to the left because the question noted that the two conducting balls have identical charge. So if they have identical charge, that means they're going to repel one another by an electrostatic force. So the ball on the left would be pushed to the left, and that is why we have indicated that force pointing to the left. What we want to do next is take the tension force and resolve it into its y and x components. So let's draw those components. We can see that the y component is adjacent to the angle marked by theta, and because it's adjacent, we could use the cosine function when representing that component. Remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we can mark this adjacent or y component as the tension multiplied by the cosine of theta. The x component, which is pointing to the right, is opposite from the angle that is marked theta, and we can therefore use sine, since sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Therefore, we can mark the x component t times the sine of theta. Now, personally, whenever I break a force into its y and x components, I go back and I delete the original force just so that it doesn't get in my way. We really only want to be considering the components of the forces when evaluating our free body diagram. So we'll come in here and take away the original force mark T and just work with its components. Now because the conducting ball is in equilibrium we know that the forces balance each other out. And so that means that the force that's pointing to the left, which again is the electrostatic force, must be equal in magnitude to the force that's pointing to the right, this component of the tension. So we can come over here and actually write that T sine of theta is equal to the electrostatic force. The same concept would apply in the y direction. We could take the force T cos of theta and set that equal to mg, since their magnitudes are the same. And these are results that perhaps we will refer back to later in the problem. Let's return back to the original figure. And what we've done is we've drawn a right triangle within that figure. And we know that if this distance between the balls is marked x, then the distance right here would necessarily be x divided by 2. And if we look at the angle theta here, we can see that opposite to that angle is this side marked x over 2. And then adjacent to that angle is this side right here. Now what we want to do is come up with an expression for this side right here. For now, we can just call it b. And we'll use Pythagorean theorem, since we have a right triangle, to relate l, x over 2, and b together. So we can say that one side of the right triangle squared plus the other side is equal to the hypotenuse, and then we're squaring all those sides, of course. And we're going to try to solve this for b, so we'll subtract the term x over 2 squared. And then we can take the square root of both sides to solve for b. And we return to the question, and it noted that theta can be assumed to be very, very small. So looking back at the diagram, if this angle were really, really tiny, that means that this distance over here would be very, very small, almost negligible, in fact. So we're going to make a rough approximation that the distance x over 2 is almost 0. And that's actually going to knock out this term right here, leaving us with just the square root of l squared, which, of course, is just l. So if we return back to this angle, we could say that the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite side, which is x over 2, divided by the adjacent side, which we marked b, but we just solved for b and found that it was roughly l. And then, of course, if we do a little algebra here, we would have x over 2l. Next, we want to consider the electrostatic force that is exerted on that conducting ball. We know that the electrostatic force, Fe, would equal a constant multiplied by the 
magnitude of the first charge, and then multiplied by the magnitude of the next charge, divided by the distance between them squared. Now the distance between them has been marked as x, so we can write x squared. We could simplify this just a little bit by multiplying the charges to make kq squared over x squared. Now we just have to play with these results in order to come up with this derivation. Let's go back to the two equations that were colored in blue from earlier. If we divide these two equations, we can see that t divided by t would actually cancel. Sine divided by cosine, of course, makes tangent. And then if we divide over here, we're going to have the electrostatic force over mg. We could then multiply both sides of this equation by mg so that the mg's cancel here. And now we'll take the results from over here and substitute them into our blue equation. So this expression for the electrostatic force is going to be substituted in right here. And then for tangent of theta, we can substitute in x over 2l. So let's make those substitutions. Now we'll try to solve this equation for x, since that's what part a is asking us to do. We'll multiply both sides of the equation by x squared. The x squareds will cancel out. On the right, notice that on the left, x squared times x will make x cubed. So you're going to have x cubed mg all over 2l is equal to kq squared. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by 2l. So we'll have x cubed mg is equal to kq squared times 2l. We then divide both sides of the equation by mg. So they cancel out there. And then finally, we can take the cube root, or equivalently, we can raise both sides of the equation to the power of 1 third. And that's going to cancel out the cubing right here, leaving us with just x. To finish it off, let's remember that k is equivalent to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught. So we're going to replace that k right here in the equation with 1 over 4 pi We'll squeeze in that epsilon right there. Notice in the numerator we have a factor of 2. So we can actually divide the numerator and the denominator by 2. That's going to cancel out this 2 and make that 4 become a 2. So we'll just write this one more time. It got a little bit obscured. We will be left with q squared l all over 2 pi epsilon or epsilon naught mg, all of which is raised to the 1 3rd power. So this completes part a. Now for part b, it's asking us for the magnitude of the charge q. We actually have to turn around and solve this equation for q. Now we have brought the equation back to the form in which it had k rather than 1 over 4 pi epsilon. We're going to have to cube both sides to get rid of the 1 third. We'll multiply both sides by mg. So we'll cancel out on the right. And then finally we'll divide by k times 2L. So we'll cancel out here. That'll leave us with Q squared on the right side, so we'd actually have to take the square root. So we'll just stick a square root here, and that will solve this for Q. We can now go ahead and plug in the known values that were given to us. The mass was in grams, so you'll have to multiply that by 10 to the minus 3 to get it into kilograms. G, of course, is 9.8. X was given to us in centimeters, so we'll have to multiply it by 10 to the minus 2. And then don't forget to cube the X. Divided by K, which is a constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th times 2 times L, which is given in centimeters as well, so we'll have to multiply that by 10 to the minus 2. And when you carefully plug that into your calculator, you should get roughly 2.4 times 10 to the minus 8. And technically that would be both positive and negative, but since the question is only asking for the magnitude of the charge, we would leave our answer as just the positive 2.4 times 10 to the minus 8, and the unit there will be coulombs. And so this is the correct answer for the magnitude of the charge, Q.